Amen. If you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verses 18 through 25. What a joy and blessing it's been this morning to hear uh, our children lead us in worship and to see uh, them bring the palms down and all the different things that are just beautiful about the Sunday. I was telling Nathan earlier this week, I feel like Palm Sunday's underrated. It's just such a special day and a sweet day in the life of the church. And it's a good reminder uh, as we look to the cross that the praises that the Lord Jesus uh, received were deserved. Uh, and the Lord ordained it such that he would be received and praised ahead of his crucifixion, even though they weren't doing it for his crucifixion. They would later see, as we'll talk about, the cross as a scandal. But here, uh, in these moments, we see the way that they ought to be praising him for what he's about um, to do. If you have your Bibles open there to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, I'm going to ask you if you would go ahead and stand with me out of reverence for the reading of the words of our God. The Apostle Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in such a way that as, this, as the words on this page are being read, God himself is speaking to us, beginning in verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Let's pray together. Oh Lord our God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his gospel. And God, we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together as your people to celebrate the triumphal entry of our Lord and to worship our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, who himself was indeed crucified. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I'm afraid of something. I'm afraid we have gotten used to the cross. I'm afraid we've grown too accustomed to the cross. We see pictures of it. We see it on necklaces. We think about it a lot. Just the other day, I was sitting in a restaurant eating biscuits and gravy. And as I'm eating biscuits and gravy, I look over and there is a cross with a picture of Jesus on it. It's everywhere. You can eat biscuits and gravy and turn around and see the cross. Because of the ubiquity of Christian thoughts, thought in our lives, I think we have. I think we've gotten used to the cross. And I'm afraid that we've gotten so used to it that we've missed the ways in which the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ turns the world upside down. I'm afraid we've missed and we've lost sight of the scandal of the cross. The earliest known pictorial representation of the crucifixion of Jesus is known as the Eleximenos Graffito. It's from around uh, the year 200, most scholars think, and it was inscribed in a, a wall in Rome into the plaster. I've got a picture of it for you available there. There it is on the screen, the Alex, Alexamenos Graffito. We tend to think that people in the ancient world were gullible and dumb, that they would worship anything. However, when we look closer at this picture, and in fact, I've got a second slide for you so you can see in clear, more in a cartoonish way, what this looks like. Notice this. Look at it for just a moment. 
This depiction of Jesus was not what we would think of. It's not the way we would think of a crucifix or a picture of Jesus. Instead, it's, it's not veneration, it's mocking. In fact, it's uh, someone being crucified. They're, they're depicted as being nude and their head is the head, it seems like, of a donkey. And then there's a man there holding his arm up as if in worship. And the inscription is sort of hard to read there, but it says, Aleximenos worships God. Now think about this for the Roman who inscribed this. A nude donkey nailed to the cross is there and he is being mocked. The worshiper Aleximenos is being mocked. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. This is the year 200. This is not even 150 years or maybe not even 200 years past when the Lord Jesus was crucified that already in these earliest days of Christianity, the world did not see the cross as a good thing. We can tend to look at these things and think, right, but in the ancient world, somebody was raising from the dead every other day. Those people were so gullible. They believed anything. But read what, the, what, what this inscription says. Aleximenos worships God. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. Today I want you to see that the cross of Christ is just as scandalous and just as foolish today as it was then. I I want to reintroduce you to the scandal of the cross and to the scandal of Easter. This year at Easter time, I want you to feel the full full weight of of the foolishness of Easter, the foolishness of the cross, the foolishness of the resurrection. And this morning, I'm going to show you four points on the foolishness of the cross. Four points on the foolishness of the cross this morning. Here's the first. The cross kills our self-sufficiency. The cross kills our self-sufficiency. Why is it that the foolishness, that the cross is folly to those who are perishing? It's what the text says. Notice what the Bible says. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will destroy. Consider this for just a moment. It's folly to those who are perishing because I think in the modern day and in the world we live in, typically, in our world at least, people see the cross as folly because we feel like we are doing fine on our own. We feel like we're doing fine on our own. Most of us who have grown up in the Bible Belt in the South, who have grown up in church, sort of understand as we've grown up that people need to be saved. But most people in the world don't think that way. Most people don't wake up in the morning and say, I wonder what I can do today to be saved. I wonder what I could do today to be in a relationship with God. Now, I do think that desire to commune with God presents itself in other ways, and that desire to be saved presents itself in other ways, but I don't think people consciously think that way. Perhaps the biggest challenge to modern Christians is convincing folks that they need to be saved, that they need to know God in the first place. We consider that we're doing fine. Most people believe that their wisdom is sufficient. Think about the way even Christians think sometimes. Think about the way even you think sometimes. But think about sort of the way we talk to ourselves in the world we live in. If only my politician would win, things would get better. If only my politician would win, things would get better. And then they win. And then we say, well, at least there's the next primaries, you know? We move on pretty quickly, don't we? If only the world could visit my therapist and become as well-adjusted as I am, things would get better. If only people could get a proper education, if we could deliver people from their ignorance, we could all be, it's a word I hear a lot, decent human beings. Just be a decent human being. If only we could get the world to go back to the way it was when I was growing up, the world could be fixed. 
I, I saw a, a, a Twitter thread the other day that showed the history of the phrase, kids have it too easy today. And the, the latest one was from 2023, where they saw in the newspaper someone had said the kids today have it too easy. And the oldest one they showed was from the 1820s, where people said kids today have it too easy. Well, one, one of the things, that, kids have it too easy today. Back in my day, we had to saw our own logs to build our own houses. So some of you had it too easy when you were growing up, too. All right. They didn't... <laughs> I thought at least the fellow millennials would laugh at that, you know, anyway. If only we could get folks to think and live progressively, then we could get on the right side of history. Think about the way we talk to ourselves, the way we say we're doing just fine on our own. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. For it is written, verse 19, he quotes the prophet Isaiah, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning. I will thwart. We see the cross as foolish and people see the cross as foolish because of the way it destroys our wisdom and thwarts our discernment. You see, the cross destroys human wisdom by showing us that we need radical intervention, not simply progress along human lines. It thwarts our discernment because it shows us sin is our greatest problem, and we think anything else might be our greatest problem. It destroys our wisdom by showing us that all of our relationships are intricately connected to our relationship with our creator. And so we can talk about the way men and women relate to one another and people of different races relate to one another all we want. But until our relationship with our creator is healed, all of the horizontal relationships will never be fixed. It thwarts our discernment by taking that which is despised and lowly and unthinkable and making it the centerpiece of human history. Think about what we want to put in the middle of our history. Think about what you want to put in a time capsule. If you wanted to tell people about the age in which you lived. Think about if we wanted to create some sort of a a, a piece of art or a monument to human progress. What we might put on it. Will we ever walk into the city of Gadsden or into Montgomery, Alabama and look at a monument and a memorial of our progress. And look at this great and, and beautiful painting or mural that's been made on the side of a building and look up and see an electric chair no it's the last thing we want to think about that's the last thing we want to talk about and yet the original people who saw an image of a cross or who thought about a crucified savior would have thought just that one author says that saying that Jesus is the king of the world and also saying that he was crucified is the modern equivalent not necessarily of saying someone went to the electric chair some of those people even have a lot of cultural cachet they would say it might be this similar situation to saying that a migrant who suffocated to death in a shipping container is the king of the world that's how people in the ancient world would have understood the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God says the center of his wisdom and the center of his power is the least glamorous, the least wonderful thing you could possibly imagine. The cross, my friends, kills our self-sufficiency. We cannot do it on our own. But second of all, the cross ruins man-made religion. The cross ruins man-made religion. The author Philip Yancey, I I read this in a quote in another book, but Philip Yancey relates the possibly untrue story. Who's ever quite found the original source on this? But perhaps it's true. It sounds true for sure. Uh, Philip Yancey relates the story that during a, a British conference on comparative religion, that is, people had gathered together as representatives for major world religions there in Britain, and they had all kind of gathered together, and they were debating, all these different leaders and experts in different world religions were all debating what was unique about the Christian faith. What's the unique contribution of Christianity to world religion and to the religions of the world? What makes Christianity most unique? 
someone said incarnation. And of course, everyone said no. I mean, there are other religions that believe in incarnate gods. Some said, what about resurrection? No, there are gods who raised from the dead and other religions. Eventually, the debate continues to roll on and C.S. Lewis uh, makes his way into the room. And this is what he supposedly said. What's all the rumpus about? As everyone's arguing and fighting over this. And they say, well, we're trying to determine what the unique contribution which Christianity has made among all the world religions in the world. What, what is it that Christianity is, uh, uniquely presents to the world? And C.S. Lewis supposedly said, oh, that's easy. It's grace. And as the debate continued, everyone finally said, no, that's uniquely the case. It's grace. Every world religion, every world religion presents God either as someone whose favor we need to earn, okay, or someone who really doesn't care what we do or don't do so long as we achieve inner peace. The cross unequivocally speaks to our need for grace. We tend to think that we send things up to God and blessings come back down, right? There's even lyrics about that. Chance the Rapper says that. Praises go up, blessings come down, okay? You, you can hear, you can turn the TV on this afternoon or change the channel right now and you can find multiple preachers and pastors who will basically give you a sort of uh, 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 in-shaped vision of what it means to reach God. If you'll go to God and talk to God and do the right things to God and please God, then he will bless you. But the cross speaks a different word altogether. It's the shape of a U. God intervenes with us. We need grace. We need something we do not deserve, something we cannot earn. We're tempted toward two forms, I think, especially in the modern age, two forms of self-made religion. The first is law or works without hope. Just keep trying. Just keep swimming. Eventually, I'm sure you'll please God. Oh, what miserable, what a miserable way that is to live. Or grace without grounds. Well, I'm sure God doesn't mind what you do. Just go do whatever you want. Eat, drink, and be merry for the, tomorrow we die. But you see, the cross speaks simultaneously to our inability to save ourselves and the seriousness and the costliness of sin. The Bible gives us grace on the grounds of the cross and the Bible gives us hope for holy living before God because of what Jesus has done for us at the cross. The cross undermines man-made religion in all of its forms. We cannot law, we cannot work our way to God. We cannot pretend, just pretend that God does not exist. We, we cannot live by the maxim, everything is permissible. Or, to say it in a more modern way, live your truth. You can't live that way. Eventually, your truth is going to overlap with somebody else's truth. What do we do then? We cannot imagine that there's a God of love that is not also just. It is not by works. It is not by nothing it is through the foolishness of the preached gospel that God saves those that believe. And there's not one form of man-made religion that the cross does not completely subvert and ultimately destroy and indeed ruin for anyone who might try to follow it. We must recognize that the only way to come to God is through the crucified Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Not only does the cross kill self-sufficiency, not only does the cross ruin all man-made religion, but third of all, the cross scandalizes everyone equally. <laughs> the cross scandalizes everyone equally. I, I, I'm going to put it like this. If you've never been offended by the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, you might want to think about it some more. All of us at some level have our intuitions and things about us cut across by the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how Paul goes on to talk about this. Verse 22, he says, For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Paul's just said, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. 
In other words, Paul's now transitioning from how we try to know God ourselves, man-made, self-made religion, and he's now transitioning out of that and talking specifically about Jews and Gentiles in verses 22 through 24. Notice the way that these two different groups are scandalized. Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. That is, Jews demand miraculous signs. It was a clear, miraculous signs. Greeks, second of all, demand wisdom. That is, they want impressive rhetorical skill and impressive thought. But what does Paul say? But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But in all actuality, it is the wisdom and power of God. It, God won't always give us what we think we need. <laughs> He sure won't always give us what we think we want. Um, You are often wrong about what you want. I I am so often wrong about what I want. God knows better than we do. And though we may not live in the ancient world and we may not really describe ourselves, we're Christians, so we don't really probably describe ourselves necessarily as Jew or Gentile because of the way that Jesus has torn the wall between those two things down. We are indeed Gentiles, but we do indeed live in a world that has been shaped tremendously by both Jerusalem and Athens. In fact, foundation of Western civilization in so many ways is rooted in Jewish and Greek thought, combining together to create the milieu in which we live and move and have our being even now. Even today, we tend to want to form the gospel to our own desires. We, we tend to want to de-scandalize the cross. Religious people tend to want to make the gospel more palatable, to highlight every miracle but the cross. Jesus did good, and he often did good miraculously. So we should do good too. He miraculously healed people. So we should work to make people better. Jesus miraculously fed people, they might say. So we should work to feed people. We tend to look only for the signs we like, to, but to miss the true sign of the cross. Now, I'm passionate about making sure that Christians love their neighbor as their self and that Christians give out, as the Bible would say, so to speak, a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. It's a good thing that over the years, Christians began what we now know as hospitals. It's a good thing over the years that Christians are often leading in all sorts of mercy ministries in the world, not only here in Etowah County where you might expect it, but across the world and especially in Christian areas, if Christians were to stop helping the poor and helping those in need, our societies in many ways would collapse. The the, the systems we have in place, if you lose faith-based giving and faith-based efforts in these ways, they would collapse. I am all for this. I, I think it's a sad thing to see the way that some Christians want to divorce the preaching of the gospel and the doing of good in both directions. Here, here's the reality, though. We cannot skirt around the true sign of the cross. We preach Christ crucified. But we can never stop doing that. We can never stop declaring to the world, you need a crucified Savior. Oh, how good it is for Christians to be known by the towel and the basin. Oh, how good it is for Christians to be known by baskets full of loaves and fishes. Oh, how good it is for Christians to be known for the help they're doing in healing those who struggle. How good it is that when others won't go there, Christians will go there. How good it is that Christians are known for going to leper colonies and other places where others won't go, won't go in order to help people, to heal people, to speak the word to people. But how good it is that more than anything else, Christians are known by the cross. Christians are known by the cross. It's a scandal to be known by the cross. It's a scandal to hold fast to the old rugged cross because of what that cross speaks to the world. But we must preach Christ crucified. We also sometimes tend to think like Gentiles, like Greeks, and that we want the gospel to better reflect the wisdom of the world. I know, preacher, that Jesus said not to act this way, that he said it's better to act like him, but there's so much at stake in this election, you just don't understand. I know the scripture seems to teach that homosexuality or abortion or whatever else is a sin, 
But the world is changing. And if we try to hang on, preacher, to all these old-fashioned ideas about sin and all this other kind of stuff, then I think we're just not going to have a church anymore. I, I know Jesus said to love our neighbor as ourself, but I doubt Jesus lived next door to one of these liberals. The cross says unequivocally, without question, without exception, that the wisdom and power of God and the ways of Jesus tethered to the cross of Jesus look very different than our wisdom and power and the ways of the world. Every form of worldly wisdom, every form of worldly power is equally scandalized by the cross. And you might say to me, Brother Matt, you don't understand. If we don't act this way and fight and stand and do the things we're supposed to do, and I don't mean that we shouldn't do those things at any level. I just mean we can't unhitch the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ away from the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just say one day things get so bad they close our church. Uh, Let's just say one day we keep preaching Christ Uh, and we keep holding fast to the truth of the Bible and one day things get so bad in the world the government doesn't close our church but because it doesn't have to people just quit coming to hear the message of a crucified Lord let's just say we love our neighbors so well that it makes all of our friends mad and they don't want to come to our church anymore and our church shrinks down to nothing First Baptist Church just doesn't exist anymore Brothers and sisters, I would rather shut the doors of this church preaching Christ crucified than remove the lampstand of this church with it filled to the brim because we've stopped preaching a crucified Christ. I would much rather it be me and a handful of you and the Lord Jesus crucified and exalted here in this sanctuary than it filling up to the brim without the scandal of the cross. This is who we are. This is the gospel. And at the very center of it is the scandalizing cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Though others may fail him, though others may reject it, we will stand, we will cling to the old rugged cross until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. It's who we are. The cross kills self-sufficiency. It destroys man-made religion. It scandalizes everyone equally. And finally, the cross magnifies the glory of God. Uh, The cross magnifies the glory of God. Notice what the Bible says in verse 25. It picks up a theme that's shot through the whole passage. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is is stronger than men. Notice what the Bible says. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. Verse 18, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Where is the wisdom of the world? God's made it foolish. Since God, the world didn't know God through this wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. To those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And brothers and sisters, that's why this week we will celebrate Good Friday. And how silly it is, seemingly. How foolish it is, seemingly. That we would call it Good Friday. Because nothing could be sadder than a crucified Messiah to those who worship power. But we are being saved. Nothing could be stupider than the mouth of our teacher being swallowed up into death for those who worship wisdom. But we have been called out of death into life And we see there the wisdom and the power of God. Nothing in the world could be more foolish than someone we call Lord and King who was brutally murdered in the most shameful and forgettable of ways to those who long for power and spectacle. Jesus was tossed 
out, out like another piece of trash that the Roman Empire had consumed. He was treated like a common, uh, a common criminal. And as we long for the power and brilliance of the world, we are longing for anything but the pure milk of the gospel. Those who want human brilliance to be displayed or those who want God's involvement to be obvious and overt and a spectacle, how foolish it is, how silly it is, how scandalous it is. To say that we worship one who is fully subjugated to Roman power, choking on his own blood, pierced through, mocked, tortured. You know what the people would say as they walked by. You know what they would say, because you know what you would say. If not knowing anything else, just being an average person walking by and you look up on the cross, what do you say? People get what they deserve. Serves him right. You mess with a bear, you might get bitten. That bloodied, beaten, shamed, mocked, crucified Messiah is now at this very moment seated at the right hand of God and is being worshipped by myriads and myriads of angels and all the saints in glory. And the testimony of the scripture is that that is a great cloud of witnesses who are there and they are witnesses to what we see now in the pages of scripture what we see now happening in the world what we see now with the Lord Jesus Christ in our own hearts that the lamb that was slain is actually the lion who has conquered through love and we believe and we confess that all the saints from all time that all of creation will resound with the glory and the worship unto a crucified carpenter. Loud hosannas did not only ring on Palm Sunday, they ring even now as worship of God is lifted over all of his creation as the waters cover the sea. People even now nearly, well, we're not there yet, but we're getting close. People nearly from every tribe, tongue, language, and nation are lifting voices even now on this Lord's day to God most high. And they're doing it always and only based on the blood of a crucified. Messiah the world mocks it the world tries to blaspheme God for it the world sees it as foolishness but we know it's true and I bet it's true even right now in glory Alexa Manos worships God I want to offer an invitation this morning if you've never trusted the Lord Jesus if you've never seen the glory of his shame, if you've never seen the wonder of his suffering, if you've never seen the wisdom of the foolishness of the gospel, if you've never seen the power of the weakness of Christ today, today, if you will turn from your sins in repentance, and turn to God in faith through Jesus, you will be saved.